it was supposed to be an ending. This was going to be their last game. They were going to put everything they had into making this fantastic RPG. Basically, it was their one last shot at redemption. Yet it became a new beginning. We were very happy that it sold more than we had anticipated or expected. I went nuts. That year when I made a Christmas list to give to my parents, it had one item on it, and that was Final Fantasy. But monumental successes can lead to terrible failures. It was really beautiful to watch, but you also had to listen to the story and listen to the acting, and it really just killed it. Find out where it came from and where it's going. This is the epic story of Final Fantasy. In 1987, a small Japanese game company named Squaresoft is facing an uncertain future. Square was a, a very small publisher in Japan. They'd come out with a number of games for the Nintendo Famicom here in Japan. But really, there was nothing to distinguish them, to set them apart from the large number of small development houses that were able to thrive in Japan during the Famicom's heyday. But if they don't produce a breakout hit soon, their doors will be closing for good. Really, they needed not just a hit, but a mega hit if they were going to keep the company around. Facing an uncertain future, Squaresoft gambles on one final game. They called it Final Fantasy because this was going to be their last game. You know, they were going to put everything they had into making this fantastic RPG, and it was going to be their last one, and they were all going to go off and, and do their own thing. Square turns to Hironobu Sakaguchi, one of their resident game designers, to lead the project. Sakaguchi was working before at Square. I think that uh, he enjoyed his job, but I think he was frustrated that no matter what he was doing, it never seemed to be enough. Not only for the company Square, but also for himself personally. Sakaguchi, I think, was going to leave the gaming industry. Sakaguchi, he's really the father of Final Fantasy. And you know, if, there, if there's one man who, this whole thing, and it's, it's his child. Inspired by Dragon Quest, Sakaguchi decides his project will be a role-playing game and hires well-known artist Yoshitaka Amano. For the players, the actual excitement in playing the game really comes from developing a character, seeing that character win battles, or from seeing a great storyline that takes the character into different places in the game. That in and of itself is exciting, but it has a much greater impact when it's coupled with the graphics and the music that go with it. Yoshitaka Amano is a fairly respected artist in Japan, a traditional painter. His works are very dynamic and flowing. As an artist, he really liked to challenge himself. He saw this as an opportunity to try the new thing. He saw the Famicom as just another canvas on which he could try to do something artistic. For the score, Squaresoft turns to their in-house composer, Nobuo Uematsu. I started with a computer game for a friend's company. After finishing that, another friend that worked at Squaresoft was looking for a new composer. The only available jobs for composer back then were in the games industry. So at that time, Square didn't have anyone in charge of their soundtracks, and that's when I joined. In my mind, uh, Nobuo Uematsu, he, he really brought a lot of soul to the Final Fantasy games. With his NES and SNES music, it was just brilliant considering what limited tools he was working with. He was able to get players to, to really feel a story with the music itself. With the team in place, work begins. So Final Fantasy was from the beginning designed to be impressive, designed to be a, a spectacle that uh, was far beyond graphically, musically, anything that players had seen before. So that's kind of been a hallmark of the series since the start. Square releases Final Fantasy in Japan on December 18, 1987. And audiences are stunned. Final Fantasy I was a huge success. It didn't quite reach the stratospheric heights of Dragon Quest, but it was clearly the second best RPG that uh, Japan had ever seen. And you know, compared to Dragon Quest, second place isn't that bad. It was enough to save the company. 
Of course, then, work on Final Fantasy II began soon thereafter. Despite the popularity of the first game, Square decides that their sequel can be even better. Never mind the consumer reaction. I think the reaction of the, the original designers and programmers was, oh my god, we've made this, this thing is so cool, you know, we have to do another one. Final Fantasy II arrives on December 17th, 1988, and fans take notice. Final Fantasy II was even more successful than the first one. I think that word of mouth on the first one, the Famicom user base had expanded further. Users were ready for another RPG of this kind. Square had really succeeded in making that mega hit that they wanted. The success and they had the name recognition and all they had to do from here on out was keep making the games. Sakaguchi and his team begin working on number three and concentrate on a new look. Final Fantasy III had much more complicated graphics than either the first or second Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy III was a late generation Nintendo game. It came out in 1990 and by this point Nintendo's system had given up all its secrets. So what the developers were able to do with it was far beyond what they were able to do even two, three years before. The improvements don't go unnoticed. When Square releases the game on April 27, 1990, millions of fans rush out to buy it. Final Fantasy III was a big success, just like one and two before it. Square had a good brand name and they kept making quality titles. For Square, the series truly proves to be a fantasy. The fans had come to see Final Fantasy not just as a popular game, but it had become a cultural phenomenon. But would their success translate to another country or on a new system? After the runaway success of the first three Final Fantasy games in Japan, plans are made to bring them to the U.S. market in 1990, but Square gets some help. Actually, Square didn't bring uh, the first Final Fantasy game to the U.S. It was brought over by Nintendo themselves. Part of the reason the delay is that at the time, Square didn't have a very large U.S. presence. So the resources necessary for translating a large text-heavy RPG was probably beyond that company. Nintendo's help with the translation and a promotional push with their Nintendo Power magazine helps the game find a new audience. The Nintendo Propaganda magazine had huge eight, ten-page spreads on it every month for six months, and I read them and I couldn't believe what I was reading. This game wasn't like other games. I went nuts. My friends went nuts. We could just tell that this game was something special, that it was more to it than other games that it was a world. Maybe not the most complicated world, but at the time, there was nothing like it. That year, when I made a Christmas list to give to my parents, it had one item on it, and that was Final Fantasy. That was the only thing I wanted. Word begins to spread, and Squaresoft's swan song becomes a hit all over again. It's kind of a common misconception that Final Fantasy I didn't sell well in America, but actually, it was quite popular. But the video game world is changing, and a leap forward in technology leaves the two sequels by the wayside. Final Fantasy I came out in the U.S. after Final Fantasy III was released in Japan in 1990. By that point, Nintendo had kind of closed the book on the Nintendo Entertainment System and was really gearing up for the Super Nintendo launch. Square begins work on the sequel, but changing technology requires a Final Fantasy facelift. On July 19, 1991, Square releases the fourth Final Fantasy game in Japan, which arrives in the U.S. several months later as Final Fantasy II. The popularity of the Final Fantasy series plays an important part in the launch of Nintendo's new system. Final Fantasy fans are notoriously devoted to their series when their favorite series made the jump to Nintendo's new hardware. They did too. Square and Nintendo's relationship went both ways. Nintendo's popular hardware helped Square sell lots of copies of Final Fantasy games, but in turn, the popularity of Square's Final Fantasy games drove players to choose Nintendo's hardware. Nintendo probably saw that Final Fantasy was a key franchise they had that would set their system apart from others, and because of that, they latched onto it and promoted it to give them an edge above the, their competitors. 
On December 6, 1992, Square releases Final Fantasy V in Japan. The game is considered too hard for American gamers and isn't released in the U.S. But fans would not have to wait long. The sixth game in the series arrives in Japanese stores on April 2, 1994. The game arrives in America as Final Fantasy III, and it once again takes the video game world by storm. Final Fantasy VI was a graphical powerhouse. It was the most beautiful game you'd ever seen. I think it was the first game in which Yoshitaka Amano's art was able to be preserved in the characters and in the world, not just in the monster designs. Graphic technology had improved to the point where small bits and pieces of his style were able to show through. It had a fantastic musical score. The music is widely considered to be Nobu Uematsu's best score. For their next game, Square lays the foundation for a game unlike any other. But their path will take them away from the company that had first helped them become a success. As a software provider of great content and games, to meet the consumer demand, it requires a lot of investments and time. For Final Fantasy VI, we expanded, we opened some doors. And in order to keep on doing that with the next installment, we as a development team wanted to obviously make it visually more advanced. And I think it was only going to work for us if we went with the hardware that had more capacity for us. After Final Fantasy VI came out, everyone assumed that Square would move on to the Nintendo 64. In fact, Square released a, uh, a graphical demo using the Final Fantasy VI characters. This graphical test was preparation for developing Final Fantasy VII. When Square did announce Final Fantasy VII, it wasn't for the Nintendo 64. It was for the Sony PlayStation. We saw that the PlayStation was going to be better for us with its higher performance. Square stuns the game world and strikes an unexpected alliance with Sony. I do remember that one day, Sakaguchi-san and I just bumped in the hallway, and he was wearing something on top that already had the PlayStation logo on it, basically, and said, this is what we are going for. And so I just said, OK, that's fine. And that was pretty much it. A new game is planned, one that will finally achieve the movie-like game quality the previous incarnations have been building towards. PlayStation, do you have any? The big leap came with Final Fantasy VII. That was when the company switched to the PlayStation game console. With the enhanced capabilities of the console, I now had 3D graphics as a method of expression. I now had the use of camera moves and was able to show visuals from different angles. I was able to really expand my visual expressions and create a much more intricate storyline, as well as intricate visuals for the game. When creating Seven, we were just so sucked into creating the game that it didn't feel as long as a development period as I thought. Seeing things that we had never seen before done in the sense of creating movies. Character designer Tetsuya Nomura is called upon to bring his 3D fantasy to life. I was in charge of the character design for Final Fantasy VII. This was the one Final Fantasy to date that I've been most deeply involved in. It was the first 3D game going on the PlayStation. I also saw how the monsters and characters and all those things worked out. So I kind of oversaw a balance of all those elements. It was something that the team was so excited about what we were doing that it just didn't seem like we were spending so much time on it. We also felt as if we were creating the next generation role-playing game, like we were all leading the way and we were all creating something. We were pioneering this genre over again. I think the final product was very close to what we had envisioned and what our goal was. Final Fantasy VII is released in both the US and Japan as a PlayStation exclusive in 1997, and Sony launches a massive worldwide ad campaign, and it pays off. Traditionally, role-playing games have appealed to about 10 to 15 percent of the market. You know, very dedicated part of the market, but, but not huge. And what Final Fantasy VII did was just explode that. Suddenly, everyone wanted to play the game, and role-playing games were no longer kind of this niche thing. Three million was a goal that we had in mind. And in the U.S., maybe a million. And it did go to a million. It went beyond a million. So we did feel as if, oh, are we going to really be able to beat these numbers? And when we did, we were excited, but also, at the same time, that it went beyond those numbers. We were very happy that it sold more than we had anticipated or expected. Work begins on Final Fantasy VIII. Square releases Final Fantasy VIII to an eager crowd of fans in 1999. When a Final Fantasy game comes out in Japan, it's an event. We talk about Myst being the biggest CD-ROM game of all time. They sold four million units in over a four or five year span. 
Final Fantasy VIII sold over three and a half million units in about a month in Japan. A ninth installment quickly follows, featuring the return of artist Yoshitaka Amano. As the Final Fantasy series became increasingly cinematic, logically it seemed like the next step was to make a movie. And that movie put Square in a whole other circle. By 1999, game giant Squaresoft announces plans to produce a film based on its hugely successful Final Fantasy franchise. Hundreds of millions of dollars go into the making of Final Fantasy The Spirits Within, directed by Sakaguchi. The movie arrives in theaters on July 11, 2001, but the reaction is not what Square had been hoping for. The movie was very confusing. It didn't appeal to Final Fantasy fans because it lacked the melodrama, the plot twists, the flamboyancy that had come to characterize the Final Fantasy plots. I think that movie just really underscores the fact that it's really difficult to uh, replicate animated human characters. It is just hard to say, you know. If you can say that, oh, was this movie really supposed to be a Final Fantasy movie? Or, you know, did it just have the same name attached to it? It was a little unclear. Final Fantasy The Spirits Within was, was really one of the biggest blows the company has suffered. They put a ton of money into this movie, really high expectations for it. It was really beautiful to watch, but, you know, you also had to listen to the story and listen to the acting, and it really just killed it. You know, if, if that was successful, then maybe Square would still be doing movies today. It's a shame because the, it was just a wonder to look at. Despite the box office failure of the film, Square pushes forward in the series, using technology from the film to make a game for Sony's new PlayStation 2. Every Final Fantasy has a new something, a new challenge. For 10, it was definitely including voiceover as one of the key elements. The guardian worm, Evre. The great sacred beast. It added more life and added voices to the characters that we created. Roger, I'll give the commands. In a way, I think that kind of completed and made the full circle from starting from 7. On July 19, 2001, Final Fantasy X arrives for the PlayStation 2, and fans line up to buy the game. It sells over 2 million copies in the first 48 hours. Work begins on several games at once. Final Fantasy X-2, an expansion of the story in Final Fantasy X. Find the sphere and the fiends appear and Final Fantasy XI, a massively multiplayer game set in the Final Fantasy universe. <laughs> yeah, I really wonder why this series is so popular. I don't know, but I think it is the new element, the new challenges that we put in every installment. For example, Final Fantasy XI is fully online, but still, it's a Final Fantasy game. In 2002, Square delights Nintendo fans by announcing Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles for the GameCube the first in the series to appear on Nintendo's home console in almost a decade. To play the game to its fullest, you need uh, three friends, four players total. You need four Game Boy systems that are hooked up to the GameCube. So it's really unique for a Final Fantasy game in that you have this group feeling to it. Game giant Squaresoft announces Final Fantasy XII to an eager crowd of fans. Final Fantasy is the most successful role-playing franchise with millions of adoring fans. For a series that has been out for over 10 years easily, I think by now there is a different generation of users and gamers who are playing the current Final Fantasies. So in a sense, this game has provided content for a few generations so far, and hopefully that will continue. That will be one of my dreams. To continue Final Fantasy, and to many generations, that can be something. And when a consumer sees Square on the box, they know this game is going to have amazing production values. This game has been tested to death to make sure it's fun. And, you know, this game is going to be solid. I think for gamers, whenever a new Final Fantasy game is announced, the, the world pretty much stops. Even fans that don't like Final Fantasy, they want to know what's going on because it, it just has such a huge impact. It's such an incredibly successful series, wildly popular. With all our games, especially Final Fantasy, we try to do what is at the highest point of interest of every installment of the series. We start fresh and do something completely new. We just don't do any repeats. We do eight full model changes. We always try to keep up with ourselves. I don't really have this huge goal right in front of me. 
It's more what we believe in. What we believe is going to make a unique and great product. That is all we basically focus on and see how that rolls into something grand. There are certain styles for Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy-ness, if you will. Since the beginning of the series, my staff has been able to work with the latest technology and the latest tools of the time and really challenge themselves every time they work on a new title. The series is like a giant toy box and you find something entertaining and really cool to look at and wondering, wow, how did they put all this fun stuff in here? As far as the future goes, I think Final Fantasy is going to be around for a long, long time. As long as Square keeps the talent fresh and the games interesting and exciting, I think that consumers are going to enjoy the games. Once in a while. I hope that the series will continue in the way forever, as long as there are users out there who want Final Fantasy. Really, I don't think there's going to be a final Final Fantasy.